has joined us. So um, I think is Nicole is here. Maybe Nicole, you can show your video um, and maybe start sharing your screen. And then I will go ahead with the introduction. We are Rose um, from the Vaccine Research Center. Um, she's the chief of the Humoral Immunology Corps, the Vaccine Research Center, National Institute of Health um, in Bethesda, Maryland. She obtained her PhD from Cornell University in 1998, uh, followed by postdoctoral work at the Seattle Biomedical Re uh, Research Institute and the Department of Pathobiology at UW. So as uh, uh, Nicole was telling me a bit earlier, she used to come to these seminars and now she's giving, she's giving one, so this is great. Um, her research focus is um, the, the identification and characterization of broadly neutralizing antibodies from HIV infected patients with an emphasis on patients followed from the time of infection. Uh, she developed a high throughput method for culturing and screening single B cells for antibody discovery. And with this method, her team isolated the most potently HIV neutralizing antibody yet known which she's gonna to talk to us about. Um, at the Vaccine Research Center, she leads a program that evaluates the immune responses to HIV infection and to novel immunogens and investigates the clinical use of broadly neutralizing antibodies for prevention of HIV. Uh, she also led a team to develop a neutralization, neutralization assay for SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, the virus that caused COVID and uh, provided data in support of the mRNA vaccine um, you know, now use for a while. So it's a pleasure to have you, Nicole, and to hear more um, about this antibody. Uh, have you been able to, um, I don't see, so, right. uh, so you're all ready to go. Okay, so thank you. And, and thank you very much, Marie, for inviting me. Um, so Marie, I've known for many years from back when she was at the Vaccine Research Center. Um, so it's, it's really nice to see, it's really nice to see you again. And I wish I were back in Seattle with you all. Um, and I wish I were giving this seminar in the Pelton Auditorium, but, but uh, we do what we have to do in the, in the time of COVID. Um, so I'm gonna talk not about COVID, but about HIV. And as Mary mentioned, I'm going to talk about a, a broadly neutralizing antibody that's extremely potent. And I'm gonna talk about both the basic research and the clinical research that have come out of the, the projects that I'm gonna describe. And so um, back when I started my postdoc in, in Seattle, back in 1998, um, which I cannot believe it was that long ago, um, there were kind of two camps in HIV vaccine research. There was the antibody camp and the T cell camp. And um, it, it's almost not fair to call it a camp because the broadly neutralizing, it, the neutralizing antibody people were sort of off in a corner, um, not doing very much at all. And we would be lucky to get you know one session out of eight at a Keystone meeting. And then uh, about 10 years later, everything just switched and, neutralizing antibodies became sort of the dominant research focus of a lot of, of most HIV research. And now things I hope are swinging back a little bit and we have a more balanced view of what might be, might be um, required for an HIV vaccine. Um, but I can't say that I'm disappointed that neutralizing antibodies um, have become a dominant force in HIV vaccine research because I think they're really interesting and I do believe that they're extremely important. Um, and so there's two main, when we talk about broadly neutralizing antibodies, there's sort of two major lines of research that we can talk about. There's basic research um, on these antibodies as they exist in, in infected people. And um, my particular interest is in the co-evolution of HIV envelope and broadly neutralizing antibodies as this happens in infected people. And so this kind of research involves virology and immunology and structural biology. And it does have a practical implication that it could provide templates for vaccine design, as I'll show you. And then there's clinical research because broadly neutralizing antibodies have the potential for use in HIV prevention. So just a reminder to everyone what broadly neutralizing antibodies are. So HIV neutralizing antibodies are the subset of antibodies that bind to envelope that block infection of target cells by cell-free virus. This is really an operational definition. Um, and potent and broadly cross-reactive neutralizing antibodies, so we sometimes abbreviate this BNABs, are found in the serum of some chronically HIV infected patients. We've not yet been able to elicit them by vaccines, but we're trying very hard to do so. And monoclonal, monoclonal broadly neutralizing antibodies have been isolated from patients where you see this broad activity in their serum. And if you want to think about using such antibodies for prevention, they could be elicited by vaccination, that's our ultimate goal, or administered as a drug. 
And so why do we think this is gonna be an important part of a vaccine? So there's both indirect evidence and direct evidence for this. So the best indirect evidence comes from the macaque shiv, uh, the non-human primate model using shivs, where it's shown that neutralizing antibodies can protect macaque monkeys from infection, completely block infection altogether, um, when given before challenge with a shiv or even up to 48 hours later. And there's a wealth of literature about this going back many years. Um, I remember journal clubbing some of these papers um, when I was at Seattle Biomedical Research. I'm showing, I'm showing just some of the really seminal papers that have come out in the last 10 years using broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, so there's really strong indirect evidence. And then also by analogy with other pathogens. So for many licensed vaccines, we don't actually know what the correlate of protection is, but when the correlate is known, it's generally neutralizing antibodies. Um, and it seems that for the, the mRNA vaccines, at least for COVID-19, that, that neutralizing antibodies are, there's mounting evidence that they're correlated protection. And then there's a long history of using passive antibodies for protection. So for respiratory syncytial virus giving synergists to newborns. Um, serum therapy for diphtheria, and gamma globulin, hepatitis, or rabies. So there's a long, long history of doing this for other pathogens. So kind of weaker, even more indirect, indirect evidence, but still evidence that this could work. And then there's a little bit of direct evidence. And this comes from the AMP study, the AMP clinical trials. And you heard, uh, I think back in February, Larry Corey um, gave the CIFAR seminar, and you've probably heard, about, heard him speak about this on numerous occasions. Um, but just to say briefly, this was a pair of clinical trials where the broadly neutralizing antibody VRCO1 was tested in high-risk individuals to see if it could prevent acquisition of HIV. And the answer is, it kind of did, a little. So the good news from the study is that infections only occurred with VRCO1-resistant viruses. If the viruses were sensitive, they actually didn't get through. VRC1 blocked those infections, but the bad news is that there was not overall efficacy of this product because it turns out that most of the viruses were actually resistant to VRC01. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, but that said, there was a signal in this study and did provide some proof of concept that an antibody could have an effect in preventing HIV acquisition. So um, with that, I'm going to talk about um, talk about studies of a particular family of broadly neutralizing antibodies, the CAPT256 VRC26 antibodies. And again, this is both basic research, talking about looking at co-evolution of HIV envelope and the broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, and I'll talk about a spinoff of this that we found along the way, which is a highly potent and broad neutralizing antibody that has potential for HIV prevention. So uh, this has been a series of studies that have been going on now for 10 years, actually. And the, there have been multiple labs involved, as shown by the little stars on this map, but it's mainly been our labs at the Vaccine Research Center. So uh, generations of post-baccalaureate students that work with me, as well as Jay Gorman in Peter Kwong's group and Chaim Schramm doing bioinformatics. And then our partners in Johannesburg, South Africa, Lynn Morris, Penny Moore and their uh, then graduate student Janelle Beeman. And this has been an absolutely wonderful collaboration. They are just top-notch virologists and it's been a very rewarding, very rewarding to work with them. And it's been, it's been unlike a lot of, I think, um, collaborations that you end up seeing between the US and, and labs in the US and labs in Africa where that it can be a little bit lopsided. Um, in this case, it really is a true partnership and it's been, it's been just terrific. So our story begins actually in South Africa um, in a rural clinic called the Wulandlele Clinic in rural KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. So here's, here's the town, it's rather impoverished. Here's a clinic, which is absolutely beautiful. And the reason there's a clinic in this town is because of the incredible prevalence rate of HIV in these districts. So this is a, this is a map of South Africa and the color coding is by the prevalence of HIV in women who come into antenatal clinics. So pregnant women, in these districts in, in the year 2013, there were regions where upwards of 40% of the women coming, pregnant women, turned out to be HIV positive. So the level of, of just devastation on the communities um, was, oh, you can imagine. Um, and so the, the story is that the traditional leaders of this region actually invited the Caprisa Research Program to come and build a clinic there and do research in there to help the community um, to deal with the HIV crisis. And so uh, over the past 20 years, this clinic has been doing just tremendous work, has a really good partnership with the community, and has hosted multiple clinical trials. And one of the things that they've done is a cohort study, where they looked at women who were at high risk of infection um, and studied them 
you know, gave them counseling, gave them condoms, et cetera, but many of them, of course, became infected. And then they studied them over, over time. And once they're, you know, gave them medical treatment and once their CD4 counts dropped, um, they put them on antiretrovirals but, and continued to follow them. Um, and so what we have is a series of, of patients for whom we have longitudinal samples over multiple years of infection. So really valuable natural history um, samples. I will point out for the younger people in the audience, you cannot do this kind of study right now. You absolutely cannot do this study now because it is unethical to do so. Um, the only ethical thing to do right now, if you're doing a study of people who are at high risk, is once they are on, once you find out they're HIV positive, you put them on antiretrovirals. And the reason that these studies were done is because they were done before we knew that the best thing to do for an HIV patient was to put them on antiretrovirals right away. So 20 years ago, that was not clear. And because of the side effects of, anti of especially a of first generation antiretrovirals, the conventional wisdom was to wait until people's CD4 counts dropped to a certain level and then put them on antiretrovirals. And that's if they had access to antiretrovirals at all. Um, but about 10, 15 years ago, it became clear that the best thing to do for people was to give them therapies. Um, so you can't do this kind of study anymore. Um, however, the samples remain. Um, and so uh, it's, really, it's really valuable to have access to samples like this. So that's, that, that, that's my teaching moment for, for the history of HIV research. Um, and so um, one of the things that was done with these samples, so back in 2007, Penny Moore looked at samples from women three years after they got infected to see if any of them had broadly neutralizing antibodies. So on this graph, the y-axis is the percentage of viruses that are neutralized. She tested a 30 virus panel with um, viruses of multiple subtypes. Um, and what she saw is what you see in any uh, cohort actually of, of chronically infected HIV patients is some of them don't have very good neutralizing antibodies at all. And some of them have some neutralizing antibodies and some have really good neutralizing antibodies. So it's really a spectrum. Um, and we often say that only a fraction of people um, make broadly neutralizing antibodies and that's true, but what that fraction is depends on the cutoff, right? And it's really, it's really a spectrum, but at any rate, um, they identified these seven patients who had broad and, and fairly potent neutralizing antibodies. And over the years, Penny and Lynn and their group have studied each of these people, looking at the, looking at the virology, looking at how the virus is changing, looking at how the antibodies develop and cloning the antibodies from these patients. Um, our group has been involved with some of these. And uh, the collaboration where we really hit the jackpot was working on samples from donor count 256. So um, from these studies, and I'm, I'm listing listed some of our publications here, this was the second study of virus and, and antibody coevolution. And the first study that was done of, of an antibody that targets the V1, V2 region, which is the apex of the trimer. Um, and some of the findings uh, from this study actually turned out to be general principles that applied and turned out to be true when other donors were studying, even people who had antibodies that targeted different epitopes. Yeah. Um, and one of the major findings which I'm gonna talk about is that early escape mutations in the envelope drove the development of breath in the antibodies. So I'll go into detail about that in a second. Um, and so some of that has been published for a while, but what I'm gonna talk about is some more recent structural studies that help explain these viral escape pathways and explain how this actually happened at a molecular level. So um, we have, cloned, we and, and Penny's lab have cloned a lot of antibodies from multiple time points from this donor. And everything that we've ever pulled out that's neutralizing belongs to one family of antibodies. And so by family of antibodies, I mean it came from one naive B cell that, that developed and diversified and uh, affinity matured. And so we've published 33 different members of this family. We've got 12 or so more that were from more recent sorts that we're still characterizing and haven't published yet. Um, one of the distinguishing features of this family is the, is a, has a very, very long CDRH3. So um, we, oh, I'm having a little trouble with my zoom here, one second. So um, I'm not sure if I'm pointing at the right place, um, but there's a very long CDRH3. So this is a, a struct, crystal structure by Jason Gorman of the fab fragment of the antibody. And at the top is the uh, antigen combining region. And then here are, um, here is the CDRH3 loop. And this loop is extremely long and it projects away from the body of the body of the um, antibody. And so the CDRH3 loop usually consists of like 14, 15, 16 amino acids. This guy is 38 amino acids long. So it's ex exceptionally long. It, in fact, uh, when we first saw it, we thought it was a mistake, but no, it really is this long. Um, and uh, this uh, is actually something that you see in V1, V2 directed antibodies, but this is the, the longest that's been seen. Um, and one of these antibodies that I'm gonna talk about a lot later is broad and it's exceptionally potent. 
Um, so just a word about the name of this antibodies. This thing was named by committee, so it's got this very long and clunky name. So just to get everybody oriented, because it shows up in different names in the literature, especially if other labs are publishing on it. So um, the full name is CAP256-VRC26.25. Yeah, there were a lot of meetings that came up with this name um, because everybody needed their brand name, right? CAP is for Caprisa, this is the donor. VRC26 is the lineage, um, and then dot .25 is the clone. And so we needed a nickname for this. So um, the official nickname is CAP256.25. Um, the structure people like to call it VRC2625, and we have a clinical product that's called CAP256 and 2LS. Um, but this is all basically the same thing. Okay, and these antibodies, as I mentioned, target the V1V2 um, epitope on the virus trimer. Um, so here is a crystal structure of the trimer. I believe this is from Marie's paper um, and from, from 2013. Um, and so here's the viral membrane down at the bottom. And the V1V2 um, epitope is up here at the top at the apex. And if you uh, rotate this 90 degrees, and now we're looking top down, um, the, the, you can, we're just breaking out the V1V2, and you can see it's in this triangular trimer. Um, and what was noted many years ago is that uh, the major escape pathway, if you look at chain, if you look at where the virus is changing in the epitope, changes at position uh, R166 and K169 are key envelope escape mutations. And they're shown here in green. So they're right in the center of this, of this trimer. And so one of the things that we learned in studying how the virus changed and the antibody changed is that the broad antibodies in this lineage overcame early escape by the envelopes in the donor. So what does that mean? So if you look at members of the lineage, um, not all of them are super broad. So uh, again, on the y-axis, we have the neutralization breath. And now across the x-axis, these are all the different, these are 30 of the different um, lineage members of this antibody lineage, this antibody family. And here's clone 25, which is our best one. And it's 60% broad on a global panel. Um, and, but some of them are not quite as broad. These are almost as good, but we have some lineage members that are actually not broad at all. They neutralize. Um, the basically the founder virus from, from this donor and then a few other closely related clade C viruses and that's all. And so um, we wanted to know if there was any impact of the changes that you see in the envelope um, in the donor on, the, on these broadly, on these antibodies in there and is that related to growth? And so um, what Janelle Beeman did is she started with the super infecting virus, uh, which is basically the found. So the, vi the this person was infected with a clade C, super infected with another clade C. The super infecting virus lineage is what is what triggered these antibodies, right? So she tested all of these antibodies against the super infecting virus SU. And then she looked at what was going on in the sequences of the envelope at the same time point that we first see these antibodies showing up in the B cell repertoire. And that was determined by doing deep sequencing at multiple time points. And so it was week 34. And so what was what became obvious is that there was all sorts of changes happening at the in the middle of the epitope, and particularly at 169 and 166. And so particularly at 169, the virus was sort of toggling, it was sampling all these different mutations. Um, and we thought that it was because it was trying to escape. And there is evidence that this is true. So if you look at these. Um, if what we're showing, what I'm showing, sorry, I should tell you about the color coding. So um, this is neutralization data in this heat map. And so blue is not neutralized. And then yellow and orange and red is more and more potently neutral, more and more potent neutralization, right? So when you look at these not broad members of the family, these are escape mutations. All these, all these mutants are knocking out neutralization by these not broad antibodies. But now if we look at the antibodies that are very broad, especially 25, they don't mind at all these antibodies are able to tolerate these escape mutations. And the same thing is seen with the position 166. So what we believe happened is that the antibodies that were able to, that um, changed and evolved and matured to tolerate these mutations at this position are also fortuitously tolerating polymorphisms that you see when you look at other viruses from other donors that are all of these viruses. And when you have the ability to recognize other viruses, that's breath. Um, so, in, so in short, early viral escape is driving the development of breath. And we, so we knew this several years ago, but we really wanted to understand even more what was going on at the atomic level, um, what was going on structurally, because that will help guide us if we're doing structure-based design for immunogens for vaccine components. Um, and so uh, for many years, we've tried, we've tried to do crystal structures of this. 
Um, but as Marie can tell you, you can't do a crystal structure of an asymmetric unit that's bound to something with threefold rotational symmetry, or at least that's the way Jay Gorman explained it to me. You couldn't, we could, we could do a crystal structure of the antibody by itself, but not with a, not with a GP120, it won't bind to a GP120, it won't bind to a scaffold, um, will only bind to a properly folded trimer mimic, such as a SOSA. Um, and so what uh, finally allowed us to solve, allowed Jay Gorman to solve the structure is we were able to make a, a SOSIP trimer um, out of a CAP256 envelope. Um, so this is using SOSIP mutations and a few other mutations of the RNS strategy, if we like these things. Um, and in this, uh, in the complex shown in, in the cryo-EM, you get binding of one fab fragment, so one antibody up at the top. Um, it's a little off, it's a little at an angle and a little off center, but you'll see that there are, I'll show you in a moment, that there are a lot of contacts right in the center. So uh, what I'm showing you in the yellow and blue is the heavy and light chain of our antibody. Um, and then this is the envelope trimer and there's three protomers. So basically the three, whoops, three subsets, subunits, sorry. So in the light blue, the pink, and then in the back is the third protomer and that's in gray. And then these green things are the glycans, which is a post-translational modification. Um, and so, so what's actually going on? So um, if we zoom in a little bit, here again is, is Marie's structure and these green squiggly guys of the glycan, here's the protein surface. And I mentioned before, or showed you before, that this um, antibody has this extremely long CDRH3. And so the CDR, this long loop can get in, can go down in between the glycans. So it penetrates the so-called glycan shield to get down to the antibody protein surface below the glycans. And furthermore, um, if we flip this again, and now we're looking top down. So here's our, here's our trimer. And in the center of the trimer, there's actually a cavity. There's a hole where the three subunits come together. And so this long CDRH3 loop is plunging down through the glycan shield and down into the hole and actually making contacts down there in the hole. Um, and so this is why we have such a long CDRH3 loop. That's what it's doing is these two functions. Um, furthermore, uh, we had, we already knew this from the crystal structure, but this, um, showed some more evidence of it that we have tyrosine sulfation on this CDRH3 loop. So what's that? So it's a post-translational modification on tyrosine where sulfate residues are added. So that's shown here with these red, um, in the stick figure and these red moieties. Um, it makes these tyrosines even longer. So it makes the, this long CDRH3 loop even longer and it adds negative charges. And I didn't mention this, but this is a very highly charged molecule with a lot of negative charges. There's a DYYD motif here. So it makes it even more negative and even longer. Um, so why does this matter? So now I'm showing you not modeling, but this is the actual, um, the actual atomic structure from, from Jay's work. Um, and so what we learned from this is how important the 166 and 169 amino acids are. So here on the left is um, a side view, and it's actually a cross section. So we're looking in the middle of the envelope chain here. So the yellow is our CDRH3 loop, and then the sort of grayed out and pasteled out um, ribbons and loops are the envelope. And then here in stick figures are some of the, or the R166 residues, these arginines. Um, and you can see how they're very, very close to the bottom of the, of the CDRH3 loop, and the tip of the loop has these tyrosines and it's so it's basically buried down in the middle of this envelope. So let's flip this over and look at the top and you can see that there are very close atomic interactions between these tyrosines from the CDRH3 loop in yellow and then the um, arginine molecules. And we actually got one arginine to three. So one from each of the, one from each of the monomers is interacting with the two tyrosines from our antibody. So this, first of all, explains why this is very trimer specific. You can't bind to a you can't bind to a GP120. You can't bind to an improperly folded trimer, and it's because you need one of you know you're having contacts with all three of the subunits at the same time. And you can see um, that there are a lot of um, hydrogen bonds and charge interactions. Um, so changing this um, changing this uh, amino acid to something else is going to change the geometry. You're going to lose these interactions. Um, and then we also looked at, we also focused on the 169, amino acid 169, and that's um, interacting with some D residues here and here. So there's two um, lysines at position 169 from two of the subunits that are interacting. And so this explains why the major, major escape pathways uh, for, the, for the virus from these antibodies is mutations at 166 and 169. Um, and in some continuing work we're gonna do, we're gonna model what happens when you change the, when you put in other, um, 
other amino acids that occur in, um, in occur in other um, variants to try to improve the design to try to improve this antibody still further. Okay, and so um, all of these studies, you know, several years ago, suggested um, suggested a, a strategy for immunization. And so the strategy, which has been proposed by us, proposed by Bart Haynes, and honestly was proposed by Nancy Haywood back when I, back when I was a postdoc, is to um, present as a vaccine, present a series of immunogens that recapitulates the evolution of the virus in, in an infected person who developed broadly neutralizing antibodies. And the idea is you gave the right immunogens in series, you could elicit, you could recreate the event, the molecular events that gave you these broadly neutralizing antibodies. And so, you know, several labs have tried this, but um, you know, back when I was in, in Nancy's lab, we were a little bit hampered that we didn't really know what the right envelopes were to use. We didn't have this kind of information. And so now we do, and now we have it in even, you know, this, this figures from a 2015 paper, but now we even have better atomic um, understanding of the, of the structure so we can um, do, this kind of, do this kind of work. We also now have a better, um, we now have the better envelope that we can do this with. Um, and so the idea is you would prime with the, with the original virus that triggered the lineage and then boost with some of these, with uh, trimers that contain these mutations, K1CC9I, K1CC9T, et cetera. Um, and the goal is to re-elicit this kind of antibody. Um, unfortunately, this work has been on hold because of COVID, um, but we hope to start it back up again soon. So I'm going to switch gears now and, and step away from, from talking about the basic research and talk about stuff with the more clinical relevance. Um, so we did this research with the idea of getting information that would be helpful for vaccine design. Um, but we lucked out in that one of the antibodies in the lineage is exceptionally potent and quite broad. Um, and so it was uh, it had some interest for clinical use for prevention. Um, and a hypoth our hypothesis is that a more potent broadly neutralized antibody will show more efficacy in preventing HIV infection than something that's just less potent. Um, and so just a word about how we, how we define or measure potency and sensitivity. So we define this briefly, it's defined either, uh, the metric is either an IC50 or an IC80, so, which is really the amount of antibody that's needed to inhibit infection of target cells by 50% or 80%. Um, and a monoclonal antibody that neutralizes a given strain at an IC80 of one microgram per mil is more potent than one that neutralizes at 10 micrograms per mil. And if you look at it from the other direction, if you look at it from the point of view of the virus, a virus strain that is neutralized at an IC80 of one microgram per mil is more sensitive than one that is neutralized at 10 micrograms per mil. So I'm just going through this because when we talk about this, I'm gonna talk about sensitivity and potency and I just wanted to make sure it was straight. So basically the, the take home from this slide is if we measure in micrograms per mil, smaller is better. And so why do we think potency, why do we think potency is important for things that we wanna use for, for prevention? Um, so one thing that, that was shown um, very nicely in some studies in the non-human primate model is that in vitro potency predicts in vivo protection. So in other words, when we wonder, do these, you know, one of the questions that sort of, sort of haunted us all along is, is we measure these things in a cell and a TZ embryo cell line, it's a bit of an artificial system. Is this potency that we're measuring actually gonna translate into anything important in vivo? And the answer is yes. And so there've been a couple of studies in the non-human primate model, I'm gonna show you one of them, um, that show that actually things that are more potent in vitro are, are actually better in vivo. Um, so in this experiment that was done by Boris Yolg at Harvard, um, he compared two broadly neutralizing antibodies that target the same epitope. So PGDM1400 and our CAPTA56 antibody. Um, and these are very similar. They both have a long CDRH3. They both have the same epitope. But against this particular shiv, which is derived from a clave C envelope, um, the CAPTA56 antibody was uh, 10 times more potent. So it had a 10 times smaller IC50. Um, so what he did is he infected animals with this, with this shiv. And so uh, some of them got a placebo control. And this is just to show that all of the animals got infected. Um, and then some of the animals got PGDM 1400 and some of the animals got the CAPT-256 antibody. And he did a dose down. So two mg per kg, 0.4 mg per kg or 0.08 mg per kg. And what you see is that the PGDM 1400 at, at these various concentrations did not always protect. So at 0.08, um, three of the four animals got infected. Um, at the, even at the higher dose, there was one breakthrough. Um, whereas for the CAPTA56 antibody, even down at this lowest concentration of 0.08 mg per kg, um, there was complete protection. And I have to brag a little, this is the smallest amount of monoclonal antibody ever shown to protect against a shift. Um, so aside from that bragging, the, the, um, the, to give you some perspective on this, 
what 0.08 mgs per kg translates to. When we did the VRCO once, or when the AMP study was done, um, the people who were given VRCO one either got 10 mgs per kg or 30 mgs per kg. So 0.08 is just a ridiculously small amount, but it was still protective. So that's the first bit of evidence that potency is important. And the other actually comes from the AMP study. Um, so you, you probably saw this data when, when Larry Corey has spoken about it. Um, but as I mentioned in the AMP study, there was no overall efficacy shown for giving VRCO1. However, um, it was suspected that there would be some impact um, on the particular viruses that were infecting. And so to, to study that, um, all of the envelopes from all the people who got infected, either who had been treated or not treated, all of those envelopes were sequenced. And some of that work was done by our own Jim Mullins, right, you know, um, and some of the work was done at, by Carolyn Williamson of the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and then all of those sequences were synthesized and uh, made into pseudoviruses and tested for BRCA1 sensitivity by Lynn Morris and Penny Moore um, in South Africa and David Montefiore at Duke. And so here's what they found. So there was a difference in the viruses that infected people who got ERCO1 versus the people who got placebo. So in this graph, the IC80 um, is, is down here. And so more potent neutralization is here on the left. Each, um, each symbol is one person who got infected. And so the viruses that infected the people who got ERCO1 were, were a little less sensitive, a little more resistant to ERCO1 overall. Um, but what I found most interesting is that when you looked at the most sensitive viruses, there are a lot more of these sensitive viruses in the placebo group than in the VRCO1 group. And this is called the sieving effect. So basically what was concluded from this is that VRCO1 was able to protect people from viruses that were sensitive at this level, at this cutoff of, of uh, one microgram per mil, um, but not able to really protect it at, the, at things that were not, things that it didn't neutralize as potently. Um, so this leads to the, the uh, conclusion or the, the hypothesis, actually, that we used to test, um, that if we had used a more potent antibody, it would have worked better. Um, so VRCO1 uh, was chosen to do this because it's broad, and at the time, we thought it was potent. Um, so when you look at how broad something is, you set a cutoff. You say, you know, you're, you're going to be, you, you cut off of what you define neutralization as, right? And so if we define neutralization as um, 10 micrograms per mil or better, then VRC1 is quite broad. It's neutralizing 90% of viruses at that level. And actually the AMP study was powered to detect an effect if this were true. Um, but it turned out it wasn't true. It turned out that, that you wanna have things that, are, that you're protecting against things that are at one micro, sensitive at one microgram per mil or, or even less. Um, and depending on the panel, only 30 to 50% of viruses are sensitive to VRC1 at that level. Um, so I'm sorry, what I'm showing here um, again, this is potency, so more potent, more potently neutralized is down here. Um, and each of these dots is a, vi is a virus from a 208 virus multi-clade global panel. Okay, so um, you know, less than half of viruses, depending on the, in, in this panel, are sensitive to VRC1 at this level. Um, so we would love to do this kind of study again, but do it with antibodies that are more potent. So where do you get antibodies that are more potent? So one way to do it is to... Um, do structure-based drug design, et cetera, or, or selection in like a yeast system um, and engineer your antibodies to make it more potent. Um, and so that was done for this antibody that I'm showing here, VRCO7523 LS, that through structure-based design was, um, had its potency uh, improved. So you can see there's a lot more antibodies that are down in this level um, of less than one. You can also look for antibodies from other donors, naturally occurring antibodies from other donor. This example is PGT-121 from Thomas Burton's lab, and it's naturally more, more potent than your CO1. And now here's CAPS-56. So um, of the antibodies, of, sorry, of the viruses that it's neutralizing, it's neutralizing them really, really potently. Um, so this potency is why this became of great interest for, uh, for clinical potential clinical use. Um, so I'm going to show this kind of data a, a different way. Um, and what I want to show you is a comparison of our CAPTA-56 antibodies to other antibodies that have been proposed or used in the clinic. Um, so this data set is from 200 clade C acute isolates that were made into, uh, made into pseudoviruses. And so this is the work of Mike Seaman at Harvard and Carolyn Williamson at, at Cape Town. Um, and the color coding is the same as I've been showing, where blue is not neutralizing and then yellow and, and red and dark or red are more and more potent. And each line is a different antibody, and each tick is a different virus in the 200 clade panel. And so what you can see right away is our CAPTA-56 antibody is this beautiful dark red stripe. So much more potency than anything else in this set of uh, viruses. 
And we get neutralization of about 70% of the clade C viruses. And if you look at a global panel, it's like 60%. And that's because you don't do we don't do very well in clade B, actually. But that's another story. Um, so 70% of the clade C viruses and very, very potent. So this looks great. But what about the other 20, 30 percent, right? So it's not going to it's not going to protect everybody. This is not good enough, honestly. Um, so what we do is combine this combine this antibody with one or possibly more other antibodies that have complementary coverage. So in this example, PGT one twenty one neutralizes most of the viruses that are resistant to CAPTA six, and if you mix them, you get coverage of almost everything. Um, and if you have a third one, it would be even better. And so because of all of these things. There's a lot of interest in the South African research community in using this for uh, using this clinically. Um, so because it's the most potent neutralizing antibody ever isolated from a donor, it's 70% broad and highly potent against clade C, um, which is what's, what most of the cases are in South Africa and most of Southern Africa. It protects NHP from challenge for the clade C shiv. And uh, from a political standpoint, it was isolated from a South African donor in this beautiful collaboration that we've had over the years by the South African scientists. And so there's, there, there's that. Um, and so because of this, CAPRISA, which is the major HIV research organization in South Africa, CAPRISA is an enthusiastic partner for clinical development and testing in South Africa. Um, and so because of this, we decided to try to make it um, for a phase, make it for phase one trial. And the, the Vaccine Research Center of NIH has um, production capacity. We have a lab that figures out how to make things for vaccines or for antibodies. Um, and then we have a pilot production plant that can make drug quality product. Um, and so we gave this to them and said, how about it? So um, it's not as simple as just making it in the lab. So, um, so my group and, and probably some of your labs um, make antibodies in the lab. And so you do a transient transfection of XB cells and a shaker flask and you maybe make a liter and a really, really good day, you get 80 migs out of a liter and that would be great. Well, that's not nearly enough if you wanna do clinical trials. So the AMP trial used 82 kilograms of the RCL1. So like literally a million times more than you would make on a good day in a lab, um, in a regular research lab. So clearly we needed something more of a pharmaceutical company kind of a style. Um, and so what's, what's generally done for this kind of production is not to do transient transfections, but to make Cho cell lines, which are very productive. And a good yield from, yield from a Cho cell line grown in the fermenter tank is, is more like 2,000 to 6,000 mg per liter. Um, so much, much better, um, much higher yield. And so we had to do that, make the cell lines. And then a lot of things have to be optimized. Um, every antibody is a little bit different biochemically. So we need to optimize. We need to get the best cell line and figure out the best cell line growth conditions, purification procedures. Um, we want things to be highly concentrated in the vial so you can use a lot of it. Um, and so you need to figure out what buffer to use so the stuff doesn't all crash out of solution. You need to figure out what assays you're gonna use. You have to test for purity and sterility and potency and toxicity. You gotta go through regulatory. And so um, generally it takes at least 18 months to do this in non-COVID times. Things are a little bit faster if you have a COVID antibody and you're Eli Lilly. But generally it takes 18 months to do this. And that's if nothing goes wrong. So you can see where I'm going with this. Something always goes wrong. Um, and so, um, one of the, um, some of the challenges, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the problems that we had, but I'm going to tell you two of the challenges. Um, we had to overcome proteolytic clipping, we had to maximize towers and sulfation, and we had to purify without aggregation and having everything crash out of solution. Um, and so the first challenge that we had is what they uh, euphemistically called clipping, uh, which I call is a protease is coming in and ruining everything. Um, so what we found is that when you grow these things in six day culture and XB cells, it's fine. But if you grow things for 14 to 17 days in a Cho cell line in a great big bio, uh, bioreactor tank, a lot of the cells die. And when the cells die, they release proteases. And it turns out there's a serine protease in the cell supernatant that likes to cleave, wait for it, long extended loops on a protein that have a lysine. And we know we have a long extended loop on this protein and they happen to have a lysine. And so it was sensitive to this protease. And it took a while to figure out what was going on, but they found that this protease was there. So um, that obviously is not gonna work. We're having 10% of our product being cleaved in the CDRH3, this is not gonna work. Um, and so um, this was a problem. And so we tried a couple of different engineering te techniques to try to fix it. But in the end, what worked was a single point mutation where we changed this lysine to an alanine. And we tried a bunch of mutations, but this worked right away. We were very lucky actually. And so when we compared the, the breadth and potency of that antibody to our original, it was actually the same, which is very fortunate. The second, the second thing that we had to think about was the tyrosine sulfation. 
So I mentioned these, these sulfated tyrosines, and uh, there's actually four, up to four uh, sulfated tyrosines on this molecule, right? Because there's two heavy chains and each heavy chain has these two, so up to four. But post-translational modification is never 100% efficient. And so not every molecule is gonna have all four of these. Um, so um, the group of uh, and Kai and Paula Lay at the VRC figured out a way using a hydrophobicity column to separate the separate antibodies that had four or three or two or one or zero um, sulfates on them. And then we were able, and they fractionated it, and then uh, we were able to test it for potency. And what we found is that three or four sulfates was fine, but once you started going less than that, you got less and less, um, less and less potency. This is actually relative potency. So we had tenfold drop in the potency against certain, against certain viruses. Um, so that's not good. So we wanted to maximize the tyrosine sulfation. Now, not every cell line is gonna be as efficient in its tyrosine sulfation pathway. Um, and so we actually screened a whole bunch of clones of CHO cells to pick out the cell line that worked the best. And it turned out that we were lucky that of our, of our most productive clones, the one, CHO cell lines, the ones that made the most antibody, one of them, and it was actually the very best one, had 87% um, of the material was actually completely self tyrosine sulfated. But you can see that some of the other lines, it was only about half of it was, was properly sulfated. Um, and so this is something that we, we had to contend with. Um, and in fact, we've been trying to remake these cell lines and make something um, that was even more productive. And the cell lines that we got actually were worse at tyrosine sulfation. So that was out. Um, so after all of that, um, and so many, many months of development and how to purify this, et cetera, we ended up with our clinical stock. Um, and this is um, actually even a little bit more um, broad and potent than the original lab stock, which was very gratifying. You always worry that something's gonna get messed up when you go through all the steps of purification. Um, there were other problems that I won't bore you with, um, including some solubility problems, but in the end, we were able to make exactly a kilo, which is exactly what we needed for the cl planned clinical trials, um, 1600 miles. So we we're very excited about that. Um, and the clinical trial, first in human clinical trial has begun in South Africa. So Caprisa is sponsoring the first in human trial. Um, this is a phase one trial that's um, being led by Sharana Mohammed at Caprisa. The primary objectives are the safety and tolerability of this molecule, captive 56 PCLS. The secondary objective is pharmacokinetics. Um, and so we always say that antibodies are very safe. You know, antibody, you know, it's a natural product. It, it, it tends to not be immunogenic. It's generally very safe, but not always. Especially with engineered antibodies, you can sometimes get weird things. So for example, there was one called Tenny8 that we uh, were developing in the VRC that when it was injected subcutaneously caused a, a thema that lasted in some people for weeks. Um, and it also had lousy pharmacokinetics. It didn't stick around in the body very long. Um, the viability was very poor. So, so pro things can get, um, projects can get mixed. Um, uh, things can be discontinued because of this. Um, and so it was very important to test this for every antibody that we get. Um, and so this is being done in three stages. There's a dose escalation or with an um, intravenous administration, a dose escalation with a subcutaneous administration, um, which is much more convenient than somebody having to sit for an hour with an IV in their arm. Um, we're trying one or two doses, and we're also trying a product called, called hyaluronidase, um, also known as Halozyme, um, which does a temporary remodeling of the subcutaneous, subcutaneous space and allows injection of larger volumes subcutaneously. And that's actually been working really well um, with, with very low side effects. Um, and we're doing this dose escalation in combinations with the antibody, the rco 7523 ls which is much broader. Um, and between the two of them, the potency and, and the breath, we, we have a really good combination. Um, and so here's some of the more details you can see is a complicated scheme with, with an es um, you know, the gradual escalation of the doses. Um, we're testing it in HIV negative and eventually we're gonna test it in HIV positive, et cetera. And it's gonna be about 52 women. Um, this is being done, like, as I said, by Caprisa, but this time not in the Vulanguela clinic in the country, but this is in the Eat Equini clinic in Durban. Um, so it's here in the, in the middle of the central business district in a, an extra transportation hub, a lot of minibus taxis here. Um, it's being run by uh, Sharana Mohammed, as I mentioned, and also our, our um, excellent physicians, Kathleen Dotty and, and Nigel Garrett. And it's a beautiful clinic and they have these very comfortable lounge chairs to sit in, um, recliners to sit in if you're getting an IV infusion. Um, so we have some preliminary data. Uh, many people have been infused. It's, it's been deemed safe and tolerable, which is great. 
Um, that was always the first, the first worry when you do anything like this is are people going to react badly to it? That's always kind of scary, but people did just fine. Um, and we have a little bit of preliminary data on pharmacokinetics. Um, so what I'm showing is the concentration in plasma um, over time uh, for the first 28 days of uh, first 28 days after the infusion. And I'm showing a comparison of a bunch of different antibodies given at a fairly low dose. This is again, initial data, um, five mg per kg given subcutaneously. And so there's a lot of lines on here, but I'll just point to our Captive 56 product, which is here, the red line. Um, so it's not as high as some of the others. The bioavailability is not as good as some of the other products that we've tested, but it's not awful. Um, in fact, it's very, very similar to what we're seeing in this purple line, which is our VRC01, which we successfully administered to thousands of people in the EPP study. Um, and it's a heck of a lot better than 1008, which is the one that I mentioned had to, had to be discontinued because of side effects and poor bioavailability. Um, so what we've learned from uh, this initial look at the, at the pharmacokinetics is that we're doing okay. And we can proceed with, with the um, we can proceed with the later arms of the study, which is very exciting to me. Um, and so the future directions for these projects, we want to continue our cl clinical investigations for CAPTA 56 VTLS. We have this study, um, which is continuing. There are also some other studies if we can make enough additional product, um, both for prevention and cure and in the pediatric trials. Um, we want to improve this antibody. Uh, we want to increase its breadth in clade C, get better than 70%. A little bit of clay B would be nice so that we might be able to use it here. Um, and we'll, it would be nice to do some things that improve manufacturability, either from an engineering standpoint or mutations that make things, make this behave better um, would be nice. Um, and then back to the first part of my talk, we do want to continue the work to use these donor envelope sequences as immunogens with the goal of eliciting V1, V2 broadly neutralizing antibodies through vaccination. Um, so to sum up what I've told you, um, I was asked to make the summary for community, and I actually did this for both halves of the talk separately. Um, so the key questions of research in the first half of the talk is how to broadly neutralizing antibodies develop in HIV-infected people. Um, the key finding there and take home message is that co-evolution and structural studies of the donor CAPTA 56 showed that early viral escape mutations drove the development of their broadly neutralizing antibodies. This is important because we're using this data to design vaccine components. And of course, vaccines are terribly needed for prevention still. Um, and broadly neutralizing antibodies are likely a critical part of effective HIV vaccines. In the second part of the talk, I told you that I asked uh, the question of whether antibodies derived from, uh, derived from patients can be produced, and if we make them, are they going to be useful in production, um, in prevention of HIV acquisition? Key findings that, yes, we were able to make these monoclonals, and we've begun the clinical trials. Um, this is important because the first monoclonal antibody that was tried in a phase 2B study worked a little bit. Um, but we think that an antibody that's more potent would work better. Um, and this antibody is super potent. So we think that's why we think it's going to be useful. So this is related to prevention and treatment and cure because it's in clinical trials for prevention and hopefully will be in some cure trials as well. Um, and while it's, I'm excited about this because while there are many products that are made from HIV patients in, in USA or Europe or, or for, so things that are clade B centric, um, CAPTA 56 VCLS is highly potent against the viruses that are found in Southern Africa, which of course is the epicenter of the HIV pandemic. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody who's worked on this. Um, I couldn't fit everybody's names on here, but I want to highlight people at the Vaccine Research Center, especially people whose data I showed, especially Jay Gorman for doing, uh, doing all the beautiful structural work um, and our collaborators in many other labs and especially uh, Janelle and Penny and Lynn, um, Sharana Mohammed and donor CAPTA 56 herself. And I'd also like to, in the time of Corona, I have to acknowledge my lockdown office mates. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you, um, Nicole, for a great talk. Um, so if you have any questions, yeah, put them in the Q&A, or you can raise your hand, and then I think we can allow you to talk. Um, so I, I don't see any questions yet for you, Nicole. I, I have some. Um, so, the first one is maybe, you know, I was, um, I missed it, but the, 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 the antibody that you're making, that, that's a generation two or something. So, um, I mean, I know you mentioned the aniline modification for, uh, to prevent cleavage, but was there some other thing in the LS? Is that for? Yes. Yes. So the, uh, thank you for asking that. So the LS mutation is in the FC portion of the, of the antibody, and it's a, a mutation that improves the half-life. Um, it actually increases binding to the FCRN receptor 
um, which increases the half-life in serum um, and has been used in a lot of antibodies to, to do that. Um, and we showed that it actually did increase the half-life in, in, um, in non-human primates. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. And, but so um, on top of the LS, did you do any additional mutation in the fab region of the antibody, except from, I guess, the, um, the, the one that you mentioned, the alanine, the lysine to alanine? Just only that alanine. That was okay. the only change that we made. Okay. Um, I will say we have been trying making point mutants in other places, uh, trying to make this more broad and potent, and we found a lot of ways to make it worse. Um, okay. But we've not yet, <laughs> we have not yet, to be honest, um, but we have not yet found mutations that make it any better than it was in the, as it came out of the donor, except for that alanine. And that alanine does not affect the, the neutralization breath and potency. Okay. So I think Julie has a question and she um, joined, so you can ask your question. Hi, Nicole. Nice talk as usual. Nice work. Um, Thank you. Thinking about your trial, was there discussion about doing a mix of antibodies? I mean, it seems at this point, the idea of using a single antibody is just asking for more issues with escape. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So um, let me make that. Um, Full screen again. And so it's the original plan. Things changed a little from the original plan, um, but the we've already started uh, dosing people with a mixture of, of the CAP-256 antibody with the RCO7523 LS. Um, it, every antibody has to be tested alone initially for the first in human, um, but the, the goal was always to test it in, in a combination. I see. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite get why there were groups one and two in the sense of, you know, that's a lot of um, testing of different groups that probably are not going to be long term, but so that's just a regulatory requirement, right? So for any any study, we had to do a dose escalation initially, um, first with the IV and then uh, subcutaneously. So we did groups with five, ten, and then twenty mix per kg. Um, we were also testing the use of this with that drug hyaluronidase. Um, which allows for an administration of a much larger volume, up to 20 mils. Um, so generally when you do a subcutaneous injection, it's only one or two mils at a time. And this allows a much larger volume, which allows you to do larger doses. Um, so uh, you know, up to, um, which is going to allow up to 20 mg per keg doing it subcutaneously. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, so you have to do that first to make sure that this was safe on its own. Um, and then we've moved into doing the combinations with the VRCO 7523 LS, which targets the four binding site. Um, the initial plan was to also do combinations with PGT 121, but that's on hold and we may substitute that with something else. Yeah, so you're exactly right. We would never use this by itself. Great. Um, so there's a question, two more questions. So what are the theories regarding the why the LS modified CAP 256 B2 LS will have PK comparable to the non-LS VRCO1 and so much lower than other LS MAB? Um, example VRCO7, 523 LS. Uh, was this predicted by um, NHP PK? Um, let, me, let me find the NHP PK. I believe I left this in here, right? Um, do I have this? Yes. So the the any so we use two different animal models for to, to look at PK, and neither of them is is one hundred percent predictive. Um, so when we looked at the FCRN mice, um, it was actually not as good as VRCO. So these are mice that are transgenic for the human FCRN receptor. They're often used by drug companies, um, and it was um, this. This model is, is, you know, you can use it to rule stuff out, but it's not all that good at rank ordering stuff. And that wasn't particularly predictive. Um, in the macaque model, it looked like everything was the same. It looked like it was as good as some of these other antibodies, including VRCO7523 LS. Um, so we expected, we, we, we weren't quite sure what to expect from the animal models, um, which is you know, one of the reasons that you absolutely have to do it in people, right? Um, yeah. Okay, so then um, are there other broadly neutralizing anybody with a long heavy chain that bind holes that you found with CAP256? The bind holes, yes, hang on. Um, so actually the, 
there are other of you want to be too and let's okay um this is something i took out of the things i took out of the talk by hoping that somebody would ask okay so um there are um two other um or a couple other, uh, there are two other families of EB2, V1V2 antibodies that we've looked at, um, and they have two different modes of, of two kind of different modes of recognizing the apex. So one of them is is PG9 and PG16, um, and so based on some beautiful work by uh, by Marie Pansera and Jason McClellan many years ago, um, with the PG9, which has this long this long CRH3, comes down, goes down through the the shield, and then um, actually turns and goes parallel to the top of the parallel to the top of the trimer um, and binds, binds this way. Um, and then PGT-145 does this sort of stabbing down into the whole thing, this sort of harpoon-like thing. Um, and so um, here's, here's uh, showing that PG-9 um, binds sort of a, a parallel to the surface um, by, by hydrogen bonds between, the, between the, um, the main chain atoms actually of the peptide. Um, and this happens for PG9 and also for VRC26, but then you also have this stabbing down. So this is PGT145. You also see this for PGDM1400, which is a sister of PGT145. And so it's the same kind of thing where you have this long CDRH3 that dives down um, in both the VRC26, GAC56, and in the PGT145. Does that answer your question? Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess the question was in the chat. It was, it was someone know. asking the question, but I think I think it okay. does. Um, and actually, um, you know, Nicole, I do have like a one final question. Since it's it it looks like it's mostly only the CDRH three of your C twenty six twenty five that interacts with the envelope. But have yes. you done like have you done like germline reverter and where you just keep the CDRH three and how does your antibody perform? I mean, I think you've done that. I can't remember. Yes, yes. So we actually did that. So. Um, if you, so we have, of course, the, the UC, we have the whole lineage, so, so we have the UCA, but if you take, if you germline revert the, the heavy chain, but you use the mature, um, the mature CDRH3, you retain a portion of the, of the breath and potency. But um, not all of it. Not all of it, no. So, so from the, from the, the Crowium structure, it looks like only the contacts are with the CDRH3, but in 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 vivo, when you do the, the well in vitro, it's actually there's something else, or it's coming. Right. It could be right. some interaction. And the other the other thing that you see is that you can't necessarily swap the the light chains. We've tried swapping light chains. I'm sorry, I'll zoom through this. Um, we've tried, um, yeah, swapping the light chains between different members of the family. So taking the light chain from twenty from a VRC twenty six twenty six and putting with the heavy chain from VRC twenty six twenty five, and you lose some breadth and potency. Um, so, although the most of the contacts are with the CDRH three, there are contacts um, outside of the CDRH three, particularly here. There's contacts with glycan actually, um, with some of the other loops. Yeah, uh, the part with the light. It's, chain. it's all the heavy. It's all the heavy chain. There don't seem to be any contacts with the light chain. Um, which makes me think that the light chain is just sort of pro um, providing scaffolding, providing structural support for the heavy chain. There must be um, some interfa interface interaction. So that's, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so there's um, a little bit of interaction. Yeah, so there's one last question. Do you also see if C effective functionality with CAP 25 cv 2 ls I'm sorry, could you ask that again? Do you, do you, also, do you see FC effector function with the CAP 256 um, v 2 ls Yes. Yes, we do. Actually, I don't know if the LS version has been tested, but the the natural version has been tested. There's been a there's a beautiful paper out by by Simone Richardson in in Penny's group who looked at um, FC receptor functions. She looked at multiple things: ADCC, um, ADCVI, tragocytosis, phagocytosis, and it has um, the the antibody does maintain those those functions. Um, it was originally an IgG three. Um, in or we think it was originally an IgG three in the in the donor, um, but we've expressed it as an IgG one, um, and the IgG three version does seem to have um, better FC mediated effector functions. Um, and I'm not sure what the I actually don't know, and I should actually look up what the effect or, or test um, what the LS if if the LS mutation has any effect on that. And that's actually a really good question. And I'm going to make a note to myself to to find out the answer to that one. So thank you for asking that. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for this talk and for um, everyone who attended. And uh, it was great to see you. So thank you again. Yeah, nice to see you. And, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye-bye.